John Anik and Kenny Florian podcast. John Anik and Kenny Florian. I fucking love them. I can't get enough of them. Let's hear that first tonight. Big jab there from Duffy and Brett Beer is hurt now. Oh, oh, go, go, Duffy, I'm oh, cold. Brett Beer does it again. Rock'em, sock'em, robots here. Oh, my goodness. I can't believe you. are a couple of absolutely self-involved bullshit artists. Here are your hosts, John Anik and Kenny Florian. Well, if Justin Gaethje is not your favorite fighter, then uh, he's certainly not on your list of, like, your least favorite fighters in the UFC. He's probably in your top five. We're back on video today. It's episode 217 of the Anakin Florian Podcast, September 16th. That's a Monday here in the States. It's 2019. Ken Flo, it's good to see you, man. I'm hoping the video doesn't mess with the audio because I'm a radio guy. Audio always comes first, but, you know, they right. want to see you. They haven't seen you in a while unless they're watching jujitsu and battle bots in many of our listeners, <laughs> of course, are. Uh, good morning, sir. Dude, always good to see you. But especially today, your sweatshirt brings in a, a tear to my eye for two reasons. Number one, it, that's the sign that you see in Ma Massachusetts. That's the street sign. That's the, the city entering title yeah man entering title town that is just amazing i need one of those and it says established 2001 which is really when this crazy run of boston championships begun uh little hiccup in the audio there ken flow not a good sign by the way so uh i know it puts you in a bad mood when uh when the audio goes out early not a fucking good sign right now uh but i'm, I'm gonna try to to keep focus on the task at hand uh, we're going to recap this Gaethje show and uh, obviously some picks coming up on Yair Rodriguez, Jeremy Stevens, uh, Joe Osborne from Odd Shark is going to join us on the show. Ray Longo minute here in about eight minutes. Justin Gaethje, third consecutive win by first round knockout. Probably the most watchable fighter in MMA, I would think. He's got a lot of things going for him. Confidence, cardio, a chin, tremendous power, confidence. I could go on and on, Kenny, but uh, another big win for Justin Gaethje, and he got it done early as many expected he would. Yeah, absolutely, and he got it done uh, supposedly after dealing with an eye infection. You know, when he came out, I, I, I could tell. I thought something was wrong with his eyes, or uh, you know, I, I could look like he just wasn't all the way there. Uh, it didn't matter. Gaethje is an absolute savage, uh, did exactly what he needed to do against, against Donald Cerrone. I thought that, you know, he showed a little bit more lateral movement. He wasn't as aggressive as he typically is. Um, I think, and I thought he needed to do that against Donald Cerrone. Um, but, uh, he, the pressure was still there. He was a little bit more cautious in his approach. Um, and did a great job of getting inside on the pocket, grabbing that collar tie, landing those short shots, and rocking Donald Cerrone and taking him out. Uh, and referee Jaron Vallel, uh, a little late in my opinion. I know Donald yeah. Cerrone initially uh, was complaining about the stoppage, but um, it, it definitely should have been stopped. Um, it might have gone one punch too many, actually, in my opinion. Uh, you know, when you get knocked out, when you get rocked, when you get uh, buzzed, time doesn't really equate to what we normally see as time, yeah. right? I mean, you, it seems like everything just kind of goes in slow motion. And for Donald Cerrone, he was on all fours, was not moving at all, even when he was just dropped. And that was the second time he was dropped. Uh, just vicious stuff there from Gagey. Yeah, Gacy was notably uh, irritated with the referee uh, at the end of the fight. But uh, obviously, that's a tough job. And I think Gacy did acknowledge as much in his post-fight interview with Daniel Cormier. This obviously sets Gacy up for a big fight. But you almost want to just stop down and pause down, even though it's not that much fight footage, and just appreciate Justin Gaethje, right? And thank God he eventually found his way into the UFC where he richly deserves to be to prove himself in the greatest division in the UFC that he can be a champion. And I think for a lot of these guys, Dustin Poirier included, it's inconvenient that Khabib Nurmagomedov is the champion right now because of all that he brings to the table. Uh, but at the very least, this puts Gaethje in prime position, right? Were it not for the existence of Tony Ferguson, he would be the guy. A lot of big fights ahead of Justin Gaethje. What what whets your appetite in terms of uh, Gaethje's next fight? Um, you know, listen, I, I do think that Ferguson should get that next shot against Habib Nurmagomedov. Um, I, I know there's been talk about a potential fight with Conor McGregor. I think that's a fight that would be massive. Um, oh, I th I think Ga I think Gaethje obviously wants that fight. If there's one guy, uh, well, I mean, 
he, I would put him in there with the Fergusons and, of course, Habib. That deserves that kind of money to fight a, a Conor McGregor. It's Gaethje because you know exactly what you're going to get with Gaethje. Yeah. He's going to pressure you. He's going to search for that knockout. He doesn't care if he gets knocked out. He yeah. knows that it's, it's going to be one of two things that happened out there. He's knocking his opponent or he's getting knocked out. You'll, you got to love that if you're a promoter. Uh, and, and I think Gaethje is fighting a little bit smarter. Um, I, I really do believe that. I think he's a little bit more cautious in approach. He's not just blindly coming forward. Um, and uh, I think that's a fight that would absolutely deliver. You bring up a good point. Like, what is Justin Gaethje worth, right? Like, if I'm negotiating a television contract and I'm the UFC and I'm in that negotiation, I certainly want Gaethje fighting, right, in that exclusive negotiating window, right? I mean, he is bulletproof, right, in terms of matchmaking. And it doesn't matter who he fights. Of course, he acknowledged that a fight between him and Tony Ferguson would be just of the most anticipated variety. So Khabib and Tony seem destined to fight. You know, Dustin Poirier and Donald Cowboy Cerrone have never fought, so that match like now that. all of a sudden seems to make some sense. I like that a lot. Um, and those guys are number two and number four, respectively. Obviously, Gaethje's going to move up. Conor McGregor is there at number three, so the gaethje Connor fight makes a lot of sense. Uh, Ally Quinta, six. Paul Felder, seven. And then the name that nobody is talking about that eventually I think a lot of people are going to be talking about, Gregor Gillespie, still undefeated, number 11 in the world, and just a hugely problematic matchup for so many people, I would think, in that division. Certainly his schedule is something that is going to be criticized. You know, Gregor's a friend of mine, best fisherman in MMA, hashtag best wrestler in MMA. You know, you got to fight too, right? And yeah. for one reason or another, he hasn't been all that active. Uh, but that's the pecking order at 155 pounds. So I think Gaethje and Connor seem to be on a sort of collision course. We will see how uh, it shakes out from there. God, there's so many different things on this main card and on this fight card that we could talk about. Uh, did you see the fight between the Canadian Tristan Connolly and uh, and Michelle Pareda by chance? Flo? I did. I did. Okay. Yes. So, I, you know, I mean, I got nine of our stage manager texting me like, what is this cloud Pareda doing? You know, and uh, he missed weight. Obviously, if you didn't see the fight, it was a 15 minute fight of the night. Tristan Connolly on five days notice representing Vancouver in Vancouver gets the win by unanimous decision. I thought it was a close fight. I think I might even had Pareda winning rounds one and two. I watched it back this morning, certainly a 10, eight, I would think for Connolly in round three. And he certainly deserve was deserving of the nod, even though I thought it was a close fight, but just a lot of layers to this, right? Potatoes style, Kenny doing backflips and nearly landing on top of guys. Like mm -hmm. a lot of stuff that people like me haven't seen in an octagon before. Yeah. Uh, you can say he paid the price for it, sure. I mean, he has gone on to make a, a grand statement about his weight cut and everything that went wrong with it. Yes. 38 and a half pounds, uh, by the way, for Michelle Pareda. Uh, but your thoughts on that fight uh, while we have your time, Ken? You know, I'll be honest, you know, um, I, I didn't love the fight. I, I thought it was a lot of sloppy, amateurish work from both fighters. Yeah. Uh, it, just poor decision making, I thought. And, you know, and, and listen, I, I get it. Pareto wants to go out there and uh, entertain, entertain the fans and all that stuff. And, you know, he was kind of highly touted. Um, I, I appreciate that, that he's out there to entertain and stuff like that. But at the end of the day, um, you know, if you keep trying to entertain and you keep on losing or if you if he loses another or another he's going to be have to entertain outside of the UFC at the end of the day it comes right. down to right. getting the W uh, yeah. and you know losing against a guy like Connolly um, on short notice like that no, it's I don't bad. Know, man. I, it looked bad it looked yeah. really really bad and, and th those are the kind of fights that you know he's going to have to really come back from uh, and, and be impressive. You know, he, he's got to show that, yes, it was due to the weight cut, and I get it. He didn't have one of his cornermen uh, in town from Brazil. Um, you know, so he had to do that weight cut by himself, which, you know, sounds miserable, uh, just the weight cut alone. But having to go through that yourself, um, no fighter should have to do that. It's in fact, you know, pretty dangerous as well. So, uh, again, I, I feel for him in that regard, but I, I just didn't love the fight to be honest. It was good that it was back and forth. The fact that Connolly was able to, um, get the win on short notice like that is impressive. Um, whether he's UFC quality or not, right. I don't know. I don't want to be critical of that, but, um, I, I'd like to get a chance to, to watch him again. And, um, you know, it, it, it was an exciting fight for the fans, though. It, it just, for me, I don't think it was a very technical one.
Yeah, no, I think that's fair. And I think it is safe to say that Tristan Connolly accomplished more in terms of resonating with the Canadian market than a lot of Canadian mm -hmm. fighters have done in a lot more opportunities, right? And certainly the short notice backdrop, I think, helped him a lot. Yeah, remains to be seen on him. On the other side, Pereira, 25 years old, already his 10th professional loss. So uh, you can be sure, by the way, Kemflo never had 10 professional losses as an MMA fighter. He may be five or six. Uh, a couple quotes from Daniel Cormier, and then we'll get to Ray Longo. Just going to throw these out there. Quotes about Pereira on the broadcast. A lot of big actions for a guy who missed weight was one of the first things DC said, right? A lot of these, yeah. by the way, some of these backflips, man. I don't even know. should be illegal as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Um, and then DC also said, you know, the Octagon is the last place in the world you want to be joking around, right? And I don't think Pereira is necessarily joking around, but a lot of these risk-reward doing backflips, you might yeah. land with a foot on a face, which would be illegal. I don't know. It just seemed uh, a little off-putting to me, but, but entertaining to watch, I guess, nonetheless. All right, Longo coming up in 60 seconds. First, though. Is there something that interferes with your happiness or is preventing you from achieving your goals? Well, there's a solution that is about as uninvasive as it gets. BetterHelp Online Counseling is there for you. What certainly appeals to me, and I've said this before, you can connect with your professional counselor in a safe and private online setting. A lot of convenience that comes with that. It's done on your own time and at your own pace. Secure video or phone sessions. You can also chat and text with your therapist as well. BetterHelp has licensed professional counselors specializing in depression, anger, anxiety, relationships, family conflicts, grief, self-esteem, and more. Anything you share is 100% confidential. They've got 3,000 licensed therapists available worldwide. And if you aren't happy with your initial counselor, you can change anytime at no additional charge. Financial aid also available for those who qualify as well. And that is really the best part of this. It is truly affordable. Plus, Anna and Florian podcast listeners get 10% off your first month with discount code AF. So why not get started today? Go to betterhelp.com slash AF. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash AF. All right, let's get to Ray Longo. It's now time for the Ray Longo Minute. I want you to punch a hole in this fucking chest. That's what I want. The Ray Longo Minute. Starring Ray Longo. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast. Ray, you've been on hold like four minutes today. <laughs> You're big time me. You're freaking big time. Well, it's you know it's tough. I mean, we do have I, bills I would, to pay all of a sudden, I guess. You guys, though, I swear I would have sat here in silence for another <laughs> hour just so, to talk to you two guys. So, unfortunately, at least Kenny and 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 I am back on video today, and that's part of the reason why we're a little bit delayed in getting to you. So, uh, we're dealing with that oh. variable today. Beautiful, beautiful. Which, which means that your your New York tan that is wearing off here mid September uh, will be seen in the next few weeks, if not today. <laughs> the tan is fading away. Is one hundred percent correct. But we got some so, sun coming this week, so I expect to be uh, well taken care of. What do we all right, got? So, so well, let's start with Justin Gaethje you know, sort of billing him as the most watchable man in MMA. I think if you're a promoter and you trot him out there, that's as good as it gets, right? If you're trying to showcase, you know, in some respects, all your sport can be. Uh, I know your guy, Ally Quint, at times has been linked to fights with him, but hasn't fought him. Your thoughts on uh, what Justin Gaethje was able to accomplish over the weekend? Oh, no, I agree 100% with you. And absolutely phenomenal performance. Again, I think he goes in with the right mindset. He backs up everything he says and that's man. He's that guy's thrown with bad intentions, man. There's not uh, there's no set up punches with this guy. He's just looking to decapitate and uh, you know hats off to him, man. Because I think he probably I'm assuming he probably did get knocked out by Cerrone and sparring, but sparring and fighting is a totally separate thing. And uh, you know, which brings me to the other point. I, I, I now I love Cerrone. I mean, first of all, I like both guys. I mean, great fight, but I. I they got to stop him from fighting this frequently, though. There's somebody's got to step in, and you know, because it's starting to sound. I, where I used to love listening to him, it's starting to sound crazy to me now. The best thing about it is I get to wake up tomorrow and do it again. Like do what right. again? Like you right. just got pummeled. Like I, that's what I'm right. saying. I don't get. Like I get it. He loves fighting. He's an adrenaline junkie. I mean, you know, I look at you know when they're doing like a, a special on him. Like he's, you know, he's jumping off a building. He's you know he's a firefighter. I feel like what a boring piece of shit I am. Holy <laughs> God! I look at that and I'm like I I, I got to do something. I got to go skydiving yeah, or something. 
you know, it's crazy. But uh, I, I kind of worry for him at this point. I just think I, I like the fight, and there's no problem with that. But may, wait four or five months. Not this every five weeks or three weeks or at this point, you know, because now the, the losses are backing up, and he's had some damage in the last six months, man. It's crazy. Ray, uh, so do you feel like Donald Cerrone is kind of de- his skills are deteriorating now at, at this point in his career? And he says he, he, he still is going to chase that belt and that he will get the belt one day. Uh, do you not see that happening? Well, I, I see. I'm going to say, let me let me qualify my statement. OK, I see his skills diminishing if he's going to fight every three weeks. I'm saying that's not a good. Right. Right. That's not a good plan for him. I, th- I, I think with the proper rest, I, he's not in that category where he's you know he's totally diminished i just don't think his body could recoup from these wars he's getting into in such a short period of time yeah you know like even after al's fight he did he was fantastic in al's fight but i was like when he announced that fight a month later i'm like damn that's like insulting you know I mean? like, uh, right Al's right. banged up from that fight you know it was a five round and this guy's jumping right back in there but again i'm saying that was a huge mistake and and I'm not taking anything away from the, the guys he fought, but I, 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 it's too soon. It's yeah. too, you can't get the proper work in between when you're trying to heal up. And I think he's, you know, I know where his head's at. We get that. And he's a fighter, which is awesome. But now I think he's he's got to worry, but he's got to just take some time. That's what I'm saying. So I don't yeah. think, I, I can't really say, but I, I could say every three or four weeks, it's not a good routine for him. Right. And it'll get no, worse and worse. That's... Safe to say. And as as unpredictable as MMA is, it's insulting to think you could beat Tony Ferguson at 155 pounds with next to no training camp. And that was obviously the quick turn he fought. Iaquinta in May, Ferguson in June, and now Gaethje in September. No, I, I think you hit on a lot of good themes, and especially if he's chasing the belt, as Donald Cerrone repeatedly says, that's sort of the last shoe to drop for him as far as his legacy goes. Uh, then you got to hit the reset button right now. He's still going to probably get a fight with somebody in that top 10 and really, you know, get yourself in a position to really maximize performance that night because I think Cerrone's realistically got one more run to see if he can get back into that eliminator type spot that he was in just a couple days ago, you know. Exactly, John. And if you're going to chase that belt, have a calculated plan on how you're going to do that. Of course. You know what I mean? Don't just. Like you said, to think that you're jumping in with Fergie, it's admirable. You know, he's yeah. a legitimate yeah. tough guy. You know, that's all good. But, you know, first he was just fighting for the love of fighting. Now he's chasing the belt. They're two different things. You know what I mean? So right. uh, I, I think that's a great point to think that you could jump in with no training camp for a guy like Tony Ferguson uh, is crazy. You know, so I think he needs to rethink some stuff. I definitely don't think he's done. I think, you know, it's like his. Technique slowing down, but who knows? His legs could have been injured. I don't think he was kicking as much. I, I don't know. I, only yeah. he knows and the people around him. But I'd like to see him take some time, you know. And in that period of time, right. he doesn't kill himself hang gliding. You know, he'll be fine. <laughs> <you know>? Right. <laughs> so, all right. So I don't. I know you're not trying to give Trevor Whitman any information, but we'll see if you can answer this question candidly for us. If you're preparing for Justin Gaethje, if you're preparing Al for Justin Gaethje, what what are right. what are you telling him about those first few minutes, and what are you telling him as you get ready for a guy like that? I mean, obviously Gaethje can improve, as Kenny acknowledged off the top of the show, and he's developing and maybe moving better laterally or with his head or whatever. But for that type of wild man that moves forward and just chases the finish like no other, what what's the message to? Uh, to Al before that fight? I'll tell you what, that's a, <laughs> listen, Gaethje's a handful, but you got to have some really good head movement for him. You can't, he definitely can't stand right in front of him. Those, those beginning exchanges, even though Alvarez did, you know, they went back and forth and Alvarez eventually broke him down, but he had to absorb a shitload of punishment for that. So first thing when you're fighting Gaethje is you have to be able to absorb punishment without a doubt, because it's, it's eventually going to come and, you know, if you can, then I think you have a good chance of, uh, you know, winning. But uh, I do think Whitman did do a great job with him because he looked a little more calculated this fight. You know, he was in and out, but when he decided to throw, he was thrown with bad intention. So, right. uh, you know, he, look, he's ballsy. He's not, 
he's kind of telling you what he's going to do. You know, it's it's pretty similar to Khabib. You know, I mean, yeah. That 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 was the thing that confused me with uh, Poirier. Like when he said, "I can't get the guy off me." Well, you got to know that nobody has though. Like that can't be a surprise. Like isn't that what you right. trained for? Like, right. you know, that's why right. Khabib I think is should be considered. You know, he's in that goat talk because. He's going to tell you exactly what he's going to do, and there's not a fucking thing he could do about it at this point. Right. At least right. for the first two rounds. I mean, you know what's coming, but nobody's been able to stop it. And um, and somebody will, you know, as time goes on. But that's what I think makes him really good. You know, if I was talking to somebody about even when Al fought him, it didn't matter who could beat fights. He does the same shit every fight. He just can't yeah. do anything about it. You know, Al, then we would have game plan differently because he could change it up. But could be, you know what's coming, man. And right. I think that's the same with Gaethje. He's he's bringing it. This was a little more cerebral, I thought. I thought, like again, I think Trevor did a great job. I think obviously he knows Cerrone really well, and uh, you know, I think uh, Gaethje kind of did to him what I thought Al was going to do to him. And that was it. I thought it was a great fight. He's a, you know he's he's a tough out for anybody, and he deserves everything he gets because he he fights anybody, any place, and. He always puts it online, so uh, big fan of the guys. He, he, he he's, he's awesome. So uh, we know that Team Iaquinta has one foot out the door to Melbourne. The Airbnb is all set. Now, as you've gotten older, Ray, you have started to become a progressively later arrival during fight week. You know, big balloons at the host hotel, obviously, when Lago uh, walks in. I mean, and obviously, you'll be at an Airbnb this time. But no, I mean, when are you getting to Melbourne? Are you going out early? Are you trying to acclimate? Or is it just going to be in and out for, uh, for, for uh, Ray? I mean... I'm going to be there six days. I don't know if that's... Oh, wow. Acclimate. Yeah. But, uh, so I'm going to leave Monday, but I think you get there like Wednesday morning, and then I'll leave Sunday. Yeah. So All right. I probably could have left Sunday maybe, but uh, I mean, there's so much stuff going on. I'm just trying to get my schedule down to the last like minute. So I want to, you know, I got to, you know, make sure Chris is good for the next week. Right. So I think right. that, was the, that was the best thing I could do, but... uh you know, I got good seats going there, so to say. I might yeah, be Yeah, you certainly have a good seat. <laughs> oh, that's good. That's good. You got the lay flat. That's good. You yeah, deserve. I had to, man. I think, you know what, I'm, I'm hitting that. But I'm going to say this is unequivocally my last trip to Australia. So <laughs> we're going yeah. to go out bucket list style, John. That's <laughs> oh, <laughs> man. Oh, number me and, number me 11 and my little for fat, me. Me and my little fat friend will be sharing a freaking teddy bear on the plane. How about that? Oh, put that divider up between you and Matt Sarah, my God. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that'll be a tough turn for you. That'll be a quick turn for you going to Boston with Weidman after the Australia trip with Al. But as they say, I mean, you're a soldier. You, you know, you got a good front row seat. Yeah. And uh, the only thing I had to do is, uh, you know, we're leaving out. Mastro Bull has got a fight with uh, Payne in, in Tampa. In oh, man. So he's been looking phenomenal. So I'm really um, – very confident in what he's going to do. But I, I did tell him, I just don't even think I'll be, I don't think I could do it, like physically do right. it. So right. he's right. got, he trained down there. That's where his original camp is from. So he's well taken care of. But I, I okay. expect him to have a, a phenomenal fight. And I apologize for the oversight to Matt, the steamroller Frivola. His dad, yeah, Sal, the sure. bulldozer Frivola, going to be in his corner. If you can't be there, no, probably. The bulldozer right? won't be in his corner, but he'll 100% be there. He's, he's Matt's biggest yeah. fan. And he's a, He's a great guy, but that's going to be a great fight for Maddie. All right, my man. Well, thanks for uh, the time, as always, and we hope to see you uh, live and in color uh, back on video one week from today, buddy. You have a good week, all right? Awesome. And when are you getting to Australia? Right around the same time you do, I think, Wednesday morning. i got to MC the open workout, so uh, buckle oh, up wow. for that, you know? When, when, they when call my number, you know? Day? Uh, yeah. Monday. Monday. Oh yeah, okay. I think we're on the same yeah. flight. I'll. Uh... <laughs> you know, I hope we are. I hope we are. Yeah, that'd be awesome. We can talk about all right, my, my man. Have a great week. Right? I'll talk to you next week. All right, buddy. Week. See ya. There he is, Ray Longo. Every week. <laughs> And a employer podcast. Well, if you've been listening to this podcast for the last four and a half years, you've heard Ray, and you've also heard me talking about oddshark.com, absolutely my go to site when it comes to all of my sports betting and handicapping needs. Oddshark is your source for the latest odds from leading authorities, expert editorial content, and detailed matchup picks. If you're looking for statistics and trends for an upcoming game, Oddshark has that too. 
Oh, and by the way, it's all free, expert, in-depth analysis, stats, numbers, and trends to help you make the sharp game day picks. Whether you want to get in on the football action, tonight's baseball slate, mixed martial arts, or anything in between, head over to oddshark.com and start playing like a shark today. That is oddshark.com. Speaking of which, now with us on the guest line, one of the lead sports analysts for oddshark.com. On Twitter, you can find him at JTFOZ. My good friend Joe Osborne is with us. Joseph, good Monday to you. How's it going, buddy? John, I am good. How are you, my man? I'm doing well. So our producer, TJ DeSantis, does not like when people call him Tej. I, I got to know. I didn't I didn't plan to call you Joseph off the top today. Um, I mean, am I allowed to call you Joseph at, uh, here and there, or is that not the way to go with you? Well, you can if you want, but my birth name is actually Joel. So a little bit Joel. of a background on me there. Uh, my birth name's Joel. Kids started calling me Joey when I was a little kid, and that evolved to the more mature version of Joe. Uh-huh. But I still get Joseph, so you, you can call me that, and I will <laughs> respond to that if you would like. I, all right. Well, 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 Joe Osborne sounds pretty good. My dad's name is Joel, and uh, I know people called him okay. Joey for a while. But Joe Osborne's a power name. I don't know that you need to uh, – you need to change that up. So uh, our listeners, Joe, certainly know there's a heavy gambling slant on our th- our show. And so we're obviously mm-hmm. thrilled to have your insight now, hopefully a couple times a month. Um, before we get to the UFC stuff, you know, week two in the NFL is fresh. It's in the books for the most part. We got the Monday night or tonight. Your big play or so it seemed uh, was the Arizona Cardinals catching 13 at the Ravens. So congrats on uh, to you for the cash. Um how has your season gone, and how was week two for you thus far? Uh, my season's going pretty good, man. Uh, off to a winning start through two weeks so far. I'm trying to take a bit of a different mindset with these games, though, and maybe going with a contrarian pick like the Arizona Cardinals, who were plus 13 uh, in Baltimore yesterday. So we're off to a pretty good start so far, but as we know, it's a week-to-week league, and that can turn pretty quickly. So this Monday night football game tonight for our listeners who, who are going to ingest this episode fresh, as many of them do, uh, sort of a weird situation, right, with the Jets quarterback no longer ago. We've seen the line go from two and a half to six and a half, the Jets catching six and a half. I'd imagine the sharp side is going to now be the Jets getting six and a half at home. Seems like the world uh, is on Cleveland tonight to at least win in some way. Yeah, it is looking like that, and I kind of want to hop on the Jets, too, but they have too many injuries, not just at quarterback, but their best defensive linemen out, and their best uh, linebackers out, too. So I'm going with a totals pick for this one, and I'm going to go under 45 points. Reason being, you talked about that line movement. It went from plus 3 to plus 6.5 or plus 7 at some books. To me, that kind of indicates that odds makers think there's going to be a significant offensive downgrade for the Jets. But the totals barely budged. It was at 45 and a half, mm. now down to 45. So I just don't know how the Jets are going to score. You know, they were pretty healthy in week one. They only managed 16 points up 223 yards in that home loss to the Bills. Uh, meanwhile, the Browns, you know, we saw how they looked in week one, man. It was not good. They scored just 13 points. I think they will be able to bounce back a little bit, but I don't think they'll absolutely go off. So I think under 45 is the best bet for this game. The Cleveland Browns tonight are trying to avoid an 0-2 start, and I know you're already looking ahead to Week 3. You've got some numbers that are pretty telling uh, on teams against the spread that start a season 0-2. Uh, are you much of a trends guy, and, and what are those numbers telling us going into Week 3? Um, I am a trends guy, but uh, you always have to have stats to back up the trends. You never just bet a trend blindly, and you have to figure out if there's logic to them. So you have teams like the Patriots who have that long-standing uh, quarterback and coach with Brady and Belichick. So I think some trends there kind of make sense. But if you're looking at a team like the Browns with a brand-new head coach, uh, Baker May- Mayfield in the second year, when you're going back for trends uh, three, four, five years ago, maybe not a whole lot of logic. But – Back to uh, the other part of your question about uh, teams that start 0-2 against the spread uh, in the first two weeks of the season. In week three, over the last three seasons, they are 16-5 and against the spread, John. 76% cover rate, a uh, bit of a bigger sample size. Over the last five seasons, they're hitting at 65.7. Now, teams that start 0-2 straight up. 
So a few uh, standout ones there, the Steelers, Jags, Panthers, teams that maybe people expected to be in the mix down the stretch run, maybe get into the playoffs. Since 2007, 98 teams have started 0-2. Only 12 of them turned it around to make the playoffs. So not good news for those teams, especially Steelers now with Ben Roethlisberger out for the season. So it looks like they're toast. Wow. Joe, I want to talk some UFC. Uh, we we have the UFC yes. Mexico City card coming up. Uh, main event, uh, Yair Rodriguez taking on Jeremy Stevens. Um, what are the odds for that fight? And how does something like high altitude uh, affect the odds for something like this? Yair Rodriguez obviously training in Mexico. Um, how do you guys uh, you know throw that into the equation? Well, odds for this one, very close to a pick with Rodriguez. He's a very slight favorite at some books as of this afternoon. And um, it, it, odds makers, they factor everything into these lines. So if Rodriguez, he's the guy who's training at altitude, I'm sure uh, they've done some research on Jeremy Stevens to see what his training camp is like. But that's always factored into the odds. And if you are a sharp better, that's something you should be paying attention to as well. Uh, yeah. Example of that, we are just talking about the NFL. Uh, people kind of talked about that narrative a little bit with the Chicago Bears yesterday playing in Denver. They slowed down significantly in the second half, specifically the fourth quarter. The announcers pointed it out several times. They went on to win the game, but they didn't cover the spread. So that is a big deal. Joe Osborne, OddShark.com with us here on the Anakin Florian podcast. Final thing from me before uh, I get you out of here, just in terms of college football versus the NFL, the college football betting volume is insane. So if I'm getting free mm-hmm. picks from handicappers or picks I pay for from handicappers, it's like, what well, am I going to have like 17, 18 straight wagers potentially on a Saturday? How do you navigate the volume of college football um, relative to sort of the NFL, which seems just more ingestible and therefore bettable for somebody like me? Uh, well, if you, if you have an edge, guys, go all in for college football. And that's the thing with college compared to the NFL. Like, uh, you have these uh, schools that not a whole lot of people have heard of, and there's information out there that not a whole lot of people know about. So right. you're going to get edges when you're betting on the spread and total, whereas in the NFL, everyone knows every single thing. Everyone knows everyone's business that's on the field and off if the coach is fighting with the player. So uh, if you have an edge, play it. I don't think you should necessarily cap yourself at a certain amount of games. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that, that's the way I would play that one. No, that's a, a good response. So do you find that you have more volume on a Saturday than a Sunday? Um, I don't, my main focus is NFL. Uh, so I don't, but I bet a lot of baseball guys. There's some days I have eight different baseball bets in There's Some days I yeah. have one, there's some day I have none. So yeah. it all depends on, uh, you know, if, if I like the lines and if I think I have an edge. Just a far more disciplined sports wager than I am. All right, before we let you go, uh, for our listeners who want to maybe access some of the content you guys have going on, I know there's a lot of daily stuff at oddshark.com. Where can people uh, find your stuff uh, who are listening today? Uh, oddshark.com, guys, we are all over everything, uh, every sport. It is our goal to be the odds leader. Uh, big focus, obviously, on college football and NFL. We're covering all the big games For MMA fans, we're covering all the big fights. We're doing picks for all the pay-per-views. We have lines right up until when the guys fight for big fights and small for a number of different organizations, including the card this weekend for the UFC. Uh, Find that at oddshark.com. Find me at JTFOZ. Covering NFL, I'll be all over the Major League Baseball playoffs. I'll be all over the NBA once that gets going, a little bit of college basketball. So, uh, we are your number one source for betting odds. Joe Osborne. Don't call him Joseph. Don't call him Joel. I'm a, I'm a Boston guy, so I might have to stack on you fucking Joey kid if you get on a tear. Joe Osborne, <laughs> sports yeah, analyst, oddshark.com. Appreciate the time, my man. And, and we will talk to you in two weeks right before the big one, UFC 243, uh, first weekend in October, buddy. Thanks for the time. We'll talk to you soon. Thank you, guys. Good luck. All right, there he is, Joe Osborne. Ken Flo, a couple things on the Vancouver show before we spin this thing forward to Mexico City. What am I watching with Todd Duffy and Jeff Hughes, Kenny? Can you uh, tell me what's going on? I mean, I'm, I'm picturing these gamblers sitting home if you had, like, Todd Duffy by knockout on a prop bet or something. 
you know, it feels like you're walking to the fucking window to cash the ticket. Next thing you know, the guy's out of the fight. Uh, you know, I, I'm not a fighter, right? And DC on the broadcast was like, hey, man, I'm not going to judge how much pain a guy is in or right. what Todd Duffy was dealing with. Um, but if you want to get out of the fight, right, that's the way you do it, right, is you tell the referee and the doctor that you can't see and that you have double vision and, and you move on. I feel bad for Todd and Jeff, of course, Jeff Hughes on the other side. Um, talk to me, Ken Flo. Talk to me, buddy. <laughs> This was tough to watch, man. Uh, first of all, I, I was excited for Todd Duffy, who was uh, away from the Octagon for a little while. He really has kind of uh, had a, a roller coaster ride uh, in his UFC career um, with injuries and all the things that he's had to deal with. And, and seeing him back, it, it was just good to see him in there. He's a good guy. And then just seemed to kind of dead set on basically approaching this fight in the most difficult manner possible, just throwing down, just throwing wide, loopy punches, and he's standing right in front of his opponent. Why not stand back a little bit, gauge the distance? It seemed like he was way too emotional, way too excited out there, and that's kind of the problem when you are away from the octagon for that long. You, you yeah. know, you, you're not used to competing, and it's not like he has 30 fights under his belt either, right? But at the same time, I felt like it should have been a smarter approach during the fight. Okay, let's talk about the actual eye poke. Now, the eye poke didn't look like it was that bad, it, and and it's hard to tell. I can't feel that kind right. of pressure. Right. It seemed like it was a, a, a thumb, and it's a big thumb. These are heavyweights going at it, of course, but it didn't seem like it was a punch with the thumb that went into the eye. Then kind of we could say, hey, listen, he probably was seeing double out there. That kind of makes sense. It looked like it kind of just slowly rubbed against the eye. He was up against the cage. He was breathing very heavy. And he said the one thing you never say to a doctor if you want to continue fighting. And, and, you, and he said it right to the referee. And I turned to the, to the guys that I was watching it with. And I said, that's not a good sign. This is going to be stopped. If he tells this to uh, the doctor, this fight's going to be over. And sure enough, first thing, that you know, the doctor was actually giving him an out. He didn't. He actually asked the right question where he wouldn't almost get right. that question. Of, right. He was setting him up for success. And Duffy just said, I'm seeing double. I can't see or I'm seeing two people or three people out there, whatever it was. Doctor immediately said fights over. So uh, just tough to watch, man. Tough to watch and, and, and for a few different reasons. So Todd Duffy kept saying, I just need some time. And who's to say if more time would have helped the situation. But as they properly corrected on the broadcast. You don't get five minutes, Ken Flo, yes. right, for an eye poke. This isn't a groin strike, right? right? So there's some referee discretion and other things that come into this. So, uh, well, disappointing nonetheless uh, for Todd Duffy and Jeff Hughes. And uh, I know crowd doesn't like it if they got issues with the doctor or the referee. It really had nothing to do with them. You know, Todd couldn't see and therefore couldn't fight. And uh, we'll see if they run that one back. Anything else for you on the main card? Glover Teixeira, you know, the body of work just continues to be strong for this guy. He emerges by split decision over Nikita Krilov. Uriah Hall by split decision over Antonio Carlos Jr. Big win for Uriah Hall uh, over shoe face there. Misha Serkunov with the Peruvian necktie on Jimmy Crute. I mean, these Serkunov fights don't last very long, Kenny. Uh, anything uh, anything wet, anything to wet your beak on there on the main cod kick? Uh, <laughs> Dude, predicting a Serkunov fight is probably one of the more difficult things to do yeah. uh, out there. Um, it was good to see him get a submission uh, win there over a, a very tough Jimmy Crute. Um, you know, for me, I, I think Glover Teixeira, the fact that this guy is late in his career, uh, getting a win over a tough and young Russian fighter, I thought was good to see. Um, I, I don't know how much longer he should be fighting, though. Um, I feel like if this was three years ago, four years ago, Glover Teixeira would have had him out of there in the first round. He was making some decisions, and I couldn't tell if it was maybe his body not moving the way he wanted or, 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 or lack of technical knowledge, but um, I don't know, he, making some poor decisions and more and, and some poor uh, positional uh, moves there on, on the ground where I thought he would have a huge advantage over Krylov, but um, either way, he gets the win. Uh, Glover Teixeira, one of the nicest guys out there. He's been fighting forever, um, and uh, it, it just, just good to see him get a win over a young fighter, man. It, it, it's impressive. So what can you tell us about the Peruvian necktie? 
It, you know, it, it's a really devastating technique. You don't see it too often. I, I believe CB Dalloway was the last guy to hit it inside uh, the octagon. It's a rare choke. Um, you throw the leg over the head, and it's almost like you're pulling upwards across the trachea, and the leg, your top leg, is pressing down uh, on your on the on the back of the head. So if there's one thing that actually feels like a guillotine, uh, an actual guillotine that will chop your head off, it's the Peruvian necktie. It, it, if it's hit properly, it, it's a devastating choke, and it can be quite painful as well. You want some yeah, trivia on the Peruvian necktie, real quick? Yeah. What do you got? What do you got? Do you know who it's named after, or who coined the name? No. It's a Peruvian. Well, Ken Flo's Ken Flo's got a fucking like citizenship in Peru. <laughs> I not? know. I, I, I didn't know that. Who 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 coined this? Tony D'Souza. Ah, there you go. It makes sense. I knew that. I just forgot. That's right. Tony D'Souza used to train with BJ Penn. He's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. He has a uh, a, a jiu-jitsu academy in Peru, in Cusco, I believe, where, where Machu Picchu is or close by. And uh, one of the true OGs in the sport, man. And uh, he had a nasty guillotine. And that's right. He was known for the, for the Peruvian necktie, dude. Well done, TJ DeSantis. That's what TJ, I'm here for. That's good stuff. Hey, TJ, do you have 15 seconds for me on, on Duffy Hughes? I was really sort of dumbfounded watching that back. Maybe it's just because it's so fresh in my head and I watched it back this morning. But what were your thoughts on the end of that? Fight? Um, I mean, super disappointing. I think there were positives there uh, for both guys. Um, it's it's hard to sit back and, and try to, like, forecast and and see really what is happening with that eye and, and be like, okay, that, that was bad. That wasn't bad. I don't know. Rub me in my eye and it's open. I'm, I'm not leaving the house for the rest of the day. It's going to ruin my day. So I don't know, but I'm not a fighter. So, right. I just think there was so much work that Todd put in to get I back know. to that point. Uh, but Hey, I, I didn't, obviously he didn't want to risk anything further with the eye and Hey, you know, I, I shouldn't have gone too far down this rabbit hole, but you know, we've had a lot of serious eye injuries. So, uh, you know, maybe it's better that Todd did not take any more damage on that eye. All right, last thing on Tristan Connolly, right? So there have been a lot of guys who've tried to sort of take this torch from George St. Pierre in Canada. And I do think there are some up-and-coming fighters. I think Hakeem Dawadu is a guy, Ken Flo, that maybe can can represent Canada uh, in, a, in, a, in a positive UFC light. And I'm not saying Tristan Connolly. Wait, Connelly. are you saying that Tristan no, Connolly no, is going to be the not. new George St. Pierre? Come on. Uh, I promise you I'm not. Okay. I promise you I'm not, okay? <laughs> Especially because he competes at 155 pounds, and, and, you know, the clock's already working against you if you're in oh. that division. But I just – I liked a lot of what I saw just in terms of the MMA intangibles and the heart and the, just the, the ability to go out, you know, buoyed by his home crowd or otherwise. I like the fact that he won $100,000 in bonus money because that's only going to improve his training moving forward. But the point is, is we don't need a champion in Canada necessarily, right? But we need people – and fighters that that Canadian fans are going to gravitate to, you know, and I'm not casting judgment on the Elias Theodoros of the world or Chad Laprise or Olivier Aubin-Mercier, but there have been a lot of guys who we thought maybe could be that guy. And certainly if, you know, if I'm buying stock in Hakeem Dawadu versus Tristan Connolly, you know, I'm probably sitting here buying the Dawadu stock, right? But I don't know, man. I, I liked what I saw and, you know, Canadian fans and MMA fans, you know, had a lot of reasons to get behind the guy and they certainly did. Well, I will say this. First of all, I mean, that's a pretty good Rocky story, right? And getting the call on, what, five days notice and going in there, maybe not being the most athletic or most technical fighter, uh, going against this guy who physically looks far superior to him uh, and going in there and getting it done against a guy who even didn't even make weight. So I, I love that story. It's a true underdog story. Um, how can you not support a guy like Connolly, um, you know, Putting it all on the line there in his hometown, getting it done uh, it was pretty freaking awesome, man. All right, great show in Vancouver. It's always fun being there. Uh, I was glad to not be there, though, when that Peruvian necktie situation played out. I was like, what the fuck is going on down here? You know, just lay out, look to my right, and pray there's a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt sitting there. All right. So this UFC rip is crazy. I mean, it's not as crazy a rip as we had this summer, but it feels like there's a live event every single week, and I can't think the next week off, maybe late in October. Um, to that end, UFC fight night, Rodriguez versus Stevens. Let us get to the pronunciation of the week. TJ DeSantis. What are we, 8-9 and nine on the year? Are we chasing 500 today, TJ? Is that right, or 7-9? and nine? 
Um, he doesn't care. I think we're eight and See? nine. Hey, hey, eight, eight is the uh, the most dangerous number uh, in the world. No way. I mean, f- Never mind. It's what? seven. It's seven because seven, eight, okay. nine. Damn it. Okay. Hey, at least I got Tony D'Souza. I can fall back on that. You did. Yes. You got that right, but TJ couldn't give a, give a rip what his pronunciation of the week record is. You know, we're just one of myriad podcasts hey. under this TJ DeSantis conglomerate. We're a flagship show, by the way. You should want to know your record and pronunciation. I'm just saying, where's my incentive? Where's my $100 a week like Longo gets on picks, you know? <laughs> All right, well, Kenny and I will talk about that offline, and we'll try to incentivize this thing. If you go back to 500 today, we wipe the slate clean, and that would right. uh, certainly make a lot of sense. All right, so this fighter... Uh, will be competing in the featured prelim this weekend on ESPN Plus Mexico City. His seventh UFC appearance, he faces fellow bantamweight Carlos Joaquin, TJ DeSantis, of, of whom am I speaking? Jose Quinones. Give it, give it to me one more time, TJ. That one was that pronunciation certainly not going to win the point. We'll give you a second chance. Jose. Damn it. Hang on. <laughs> See, now I'm feeling pressure. Jose Quinones. All right, let's let's hear Jose. <laughs> Jose Alberto Quinones Navarro. That's a win. Nah. That's a win. Nah, dog. You said Quinones. It's Quinones. Nez. The yeah. N-Y is only on the first N. I'm not giving it to him, John. No, no, if definitely not. If you're thinking about not. giving it to this guy, I'm out of here. Oh, yeah, definitely not. I know. Okay. You, right. got right. it. you got it. You got a a budding yeah. jujitsu school, may RockyBJJ.com, like Kemp yeah. flows out of here. No, that is definitely not a point. You want me to pick that one apart? We are Jose professionals uh, Yeah, TJ, that is not a hit, but we'll still incentivize you for next week. But that is 8 and 10. I will make a note. 8 and 10 on the year for TJ DeSantis. <laughs> At least I got Tony and D'Souza. I'm falling back on that for the rest did. of my life. You, as <laughs> should you. All right. Today's main event challenge brought to you by mybookie.ag. If you found 100 bucks on the street, would you pick it up or do you keep walking? Eh, might look around, but you'd probably take the money. So to that end, why do you keep picking winners and not betting on them? I go to mybookie. It's fast. It is easy. And they pay when you win. Let's face it, where you're betting just as important as who you are betting on, and I would not be endorsing my bookie if I didn't believe they were the best. Now is the time to make your first deposit with the football season underway. A lot of big UFC shows on tap over the next few months. You can also bet on games live, by the way. I know a lot of you are getting into the live betting now after kickoff, after the opening tip. If by the second half maybe it looks like your bet is going to lose, you can hedge Maybe take the other side, soften the blow a little bit. Now, if you don't have the bankroll like Ken Flo, and you're the kind of guy who likes to bet a little and win a lot, maybe try a parlay. I'm a straight wager guy. I've said that before. But if you like the parlay, all your picks come through. You multiply your winnings. No matter how you choose to bet and attack the board, though, there's no better time than the start of the football season to get in the game. And we've got a special offer for Anakin Florian podcast listeners. Join now, and my bookie will double your first deposit. Use promo code Anik Florian to activate the offer. That's promo code Anik Florian. One word, Anik Florian. Visit mybookie.ag today. You play, you win, you get paid. All right. Take a sip of my green tea. I'm told that green tea will make me lose weight, Kenny. Is that what's going to happen? We're back I, on video. That's what I hear. That's what I hear. Uh, it, it's good for weight loss. Gives you some good energy without yeah. being too much. Yeah. yeah. you know. All right. A little green tea yeah. today. So you're going to like the updated standings here, Ken Flo. So Team Anik led Team Florian, as we have done all year. It was 111-109 going into UFC Vancouver. Uh, you and Ian Parker both went 500 on your picks, but you correctly had Glover Teixeira by decision, three points. You also had Justin Gaethje by first-round knockout, three points. Team Florian wins the week 6-3, to three, and that means for the first time in 2019 – Team Florian is in control of the main event challenge, 115 to 114. He back, son. Oh, my they God. Say, he's de- I, I mean, I'm going to do it again. Is that is that what's going to happen right now? Dude, <laughs> so, <laughs> I, so I'm going to go back to the April broadcast and see just how big this deficit was. The fact was that you big. wipe it out mid-September with three months to go, I mean, it's absolutely incredible. So, Ken Flo has the is the back. comeback kid 
Ian Parker's got some work to do. Uh, first up for us, three picks today, by the way, for this UFC offering in Mexico City in the flyweight division. The undefeated Askar Askarov making his UFC debut. He will do so as a minus 147 favorite against the returning Brandon Moreno, who comes back at plus 127. Ian Parker, good afternoon, sir. First off, I just want to throw something out there. Um, Kenny, well done this past weekend. For those of you Thank that you, don't pay attention to the picks, Kenny beat me based on the method of victories on both the co-main and main event. Am I correct, John? So you're going to question the, the main event challenge format. You already asked to back up your time slot today, and the no, answer to that no, was no. No, no, I'm not questioning. I just want to make sure that I, I was correct. Because um, I think we picked everything the same for the most part. Minus the, the methods of victory, correct? Yes, that is yeah. accurate. I believe there might have been one pick, one fight that he had. But no, for the most part, uh, that's all it was. He got an extra two points in both of those situations. Um, but you got a point. You know, it, it, is, it is what it is. I mean, hey, I'm on no, team. Was, no, right? I'm, the cap I'm the captain kudos. of your team. You know, if it comes down to the method of victories, Kenny just, uh, he got me on that Glover one. and got me by one round on the Gaethje fight. But it doesn't matter. Kenny's going down this week. I'm bouncing back. <laughs> Fuck it. And I'll... And I'm on your team, buddy. I'm on your team. Let's totally. just make it. Totally that clear. feels like it. Team, Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> team South Florida, Team Boca Raton, Team Parkland. All right. So what do, what do you make of uh, Askar Askarov here making the UFC debut, uh, getting the love from Las Vegas here against the uh, the old friend Brandon Moreno, Ian? Which way are you going? You know what? I, I find this matchup. I, I always find it very interesting when you get these guys to make their debut. They have the undefeated records, and they come in against guys like Brandon Moreno. And I don't know if Moreno is getting the respect he should deserve. And if they're basing this off of records in a very unpopular flyweight division, and that's the only reason why I see it. You know, I don't think there's any uh, shame in Moreno losing to guys like Sergio Pettis. You know, losing to guys who were at once at the top of the division when Moreno was not even expected to have the success he did. Everyone seems to forget Moreno was a huge underdog against Luis Smoka. And he won that fight and finished it. And I think this fight actually kind of plays into his favor a little bit. You know, his opponent here, who's, got, what is he, a favorite at minus 147, I checked this morning, 10-0, and 0, every fight hasn't gone past the second round, minus one fight, and he's won by submission. But Moreno's really fast, he's got good hands, and he's a good submission guy himself. You know, I, I don't love this, you know, this division in general, sometimes it's really hard to pick, but if, you know, Moreno's going to kind of get a, have a home field advantage situation here, I'm going to go with the underdog to lead off these picks, and I'm going Brandon Moreno. All right, Brandon Moreno, the pick to click for Ian Parker. Ken Flo Askarov, 10 and 0, all finishes. Moreno on the other side, 15 and 5 overall. He was part of that flyweight purge in 2018. He had lost two fights in a row. Got a main event, if you recall, against Sergio yep. Pettis in the UFC. Goes back to LFA, wins a belt June 7th. Now he will try to hand Askarov uh, his first pro loss. What do you think about this one uh, at Flyweight Kid? Um, I think Ian is pretty accurate here. Uh, listen, uh, Brandon Moreno is one of those guys who, if you meet, y you just, you're going to love the kid. Um, just very genuine, hard worker, uh, tough as nails. Um, wouldn't expect it because the guy is so nice. He looks like he's 13 years old. And I tell you what, you know, this guy, Askarov, he's got a lot of wins on the ground. Um, I think Reynolds pretty sharp on the ground as well. And it's always hard to tell how good a guy is um, unless he's fought in the UFC a couple times, right? So for Askarov, yes, he's undefeated. Yes, he's from Russia and he's probably tough and uh, no doubt about that. But I think he's going to have his hands full uh, against Moreno. I, I think Ian's on here. A and it's just tough. We know what Moreno's about. Um, yes, he's had some losses in the UFC. It's all been against high-level guys. Um, Askarov, I, I think the UFC is going to be the true proving ground here. I I'm going to go with Moreno for the win as well. All right, couple picks there on the underdog. About plus 130, Brandon Moreno. Co-main event, women's strawweight division. Alexa Grasso, minus 125, the favorite against the former champ, Carla Esparza, who is plus 105. Grasso, I checked today, still just 26 years old. Thought she looked great, by the way, against uh, Karolina Kovalkiewicz. That was in June. Esparza also comes off a win here over Vina Janji Doba. That was back in April. Uh, we will also need the round and the method of victory here, uh, Ian Parker, your favorite part of the main event challenge. Who do you like in the co-main? We should call it the Kenny Florian Decision Challenge. Um, <laughs> yeah. I like, 
you know, and then you gave it to me. I had a, I had a Duncan right there. I know. I'm I know. talking the most shit I've ever talked, and I blew the fucking lead. Listen to me over here. Um, all right, so. This is an interesting fight. I think this is kind of the perfect test for where Alexa Grasso is in her career. Only reason why I say that is because when you get to this part of the division, you got to be prepared for everything. And, and outside of Tatiana Suarez, Carla Esparza might be the next, well, kind of hard to say, but true wrestler in the division who's fought everyone there is to fight. You know, and like you said, against Carolina Kovalchevich, Alexa Grasso looked at her absolute best. I think if she keeps this fight standing, which I think her takedown defense has definitely improved, uh, her cardio is leaps and bounds improved, and her striking, she might be one of the better actual uh, technical strikers in the division. You know, I just think that Carla, at this state, at this point, she's shown better hands, but I don't think it, it's to the point where she's getting to the top five ever again. I think her wrestling's still too predictable. I think at this point in the division, unless she's able to use her combinations to get the fight to the ground, you know, mix it up to shoot in. Um, I think Alexa Grasso, you know, as young as she is, she's still pretty seasoned. I'm going Alexa Grasso by Kenny Florian decision. Grasso <laughs> by decision. And we do have to tweak the way we score decisions, but not in 2019. We don't. In 2020, we'll do just that. <laughs> All right, Alexa Grasso by decision for Ian Parker. Wait, John, Kenny, let me ask you a question. If Todd Duffy quits due to a non a not real eye poke and Kenny chooses Todd Duffy, <laughs> should I get the win for Jeff Hughes? Uh, you know, I'm so glad that you brought that up because I feel like people are going to be banging on me for being too harsh on Todd Duffy, right? As a non-fighter, uh, at That's least Ian Park was one to know. Pick different, and his guy yeah. quit. Right, but it was a draw. I mean, no, yeah. it's, it, it's a, of course it's a no it contest. Of course it is. Yeah. And Ken Flo's guy yeah, was was yeah, trending yeah. towards the knockout. Anyway, uh, all right. Yeah. <laughs> so Alexa Grasso by decision, Kenny. I, I like this fight. I think you're going to get the very best versions of both of these fighters. Grasso is obviously much improved. Esparza has learned a lot uh, over her UFC career. I think she'll present her best version to date. I like that they're being given the showcase in Mexico City. It's all in front of Alexa Grasso. What do you think? Does she take care of business here against uh, the former champ? And I tell you what, I, I do like this fight. I also think it's an extremely difficult one to pick. I, I think Esparza, the way that she matches up against Grasso, um, she can pose a lot of problems against Alexa, Gra uh, Alexa Grasso. And I think um, Grasso has struggled a little bit with her takedown defense. I do think she's way more confident this time around. I think she's a much sharper striker than Carla Esparza. She's going to have to be sharp with her takedown, especially up against the cage uh, where she kind of struggled before. Um, but, uh, you know, I think Suarez is a much uh, much better wrestler, I think, than, than Esparza. Uh, so, you know, Esparza tends to get off to a slow start as well. Now, that's something you can't do, especially in Mexico City, where I think she's going to slow down. I think Grasso uh, will get stronger as the fight goes on. Carla Esparza, I think, will slow down. So Esparza needs to get off to a, uh, a strong start. I haven't really seen that from her. Um, I like Alexa Grasso by decision as well. I know Ian Parker, uh, but I just don't think she has the the, the knockout capability of, of really finishing the fight. Um you know, enough. I don't know if she has enough power. I think she has the speed for sure, but I don't know if she has the power. Spars is pretty dang tough, uh, but I'll go with Grasso by decision. All right. A lot of agreement thus far. Doesn't always make for great radio, but I, I like that you guys are being honest. Uh, main <laughs> event. We will have Ken Flo lead the main event today. High stakes in the UFC featherweight division. Yair Rodriguez holding as the ever so slight minus 115 favorite. Jeremy Stevens about minus 105. For our purposes, though, that's big, right? Because you're getting an extra point for Jeremy Stevens if you like him. On the other side, Rodriguez, Kenny, one appearance since May of 2017. Certainly made it count. Won $100,000 in bonus money. The last second knockout of the Korean zombie, Chan Sung Jung. Stevens on the other side has fought five times in that window, but back-to-back -back losses for him against Jose Aldo and most recently Zabit Mago Med Sharipov. Stevens, Rodriguez, who wins Ken Flo and how do they get it done? Man, uh, this is such an interesting fight. I, I think Jeremy Stevens has insane power. Um, I, I think he's a guy that the Mexican fans are, are going to absolutely love out there, but um, he is... Uh, definitely in enemy territory here with Yair Rodriguez, yes. uh, a guy who, again, has been training uh, in Mexico City. Um, th that that stadium is just going to erupt when he gets out there. Um, he's e extremely exciting. Hit probably uh, 
the the craziest knockout I have ever seen oh with that God. up elbow against the Korean Zombie. The fight will go down as one of the greatest ever as well. He has a fearlessness and a confidence about him when he goes out to compete that is hard to match. His speed is very impressive. He's going to have to use his reach out there. My concern for, for Yair Rodriguez is the fact that he does get hit. And because he does have a tendency of getting wild uh, and being fearless, he can get hit with shots, obviously. Um, and... You know, for Jeremy Stevens, though, he's going to have to take a gamble. Jeremy Stevens has to go for it straight away and try to knock him out in the first 12 minutes. The problem is, if he doesn't knock him out in those first 12 minutes, um, Yair, again, because he's been training at high altitude, I think is going to come a little bit stronger and finish the fight a little bit stronger. Um, this is a tough one for me. I can definitely see this one going either way, but I'm going to go with the slight underdog, Jeremy Stevens here, to get it done oh, by knockout or TKO in round two. Wow, Ken Flo goes Jeremy Stevens, knockout, round two. And these are tough, right? And I always qualify this during the main event challenge, but you guys are picking these pick em fights, right? before fight week transpires, right? So very close fight on paper, couldn't be any closer, and you're having to pick on Monday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. Pacific. Not ideal, but of course you always reserve the right to change your pick. Ian Parker on the other side, 31st UFC appearance for Jeremy Stevens. He is 15 and 15 in the UFC, but there's certainly been more good than bad. Was making a featherweight run there for a time, Ian, now his back's up against the wall. Your thoughts on Stevens? as a slight dog here against Yair Rodriguez. I'm actually extremely surprised, Kenny, that you went with Stevens based on the breakdown, which your breakdown was pretty spot on as usual. Um, here, here's what I find with Jeremy Stevens right now. He's been fighting a certain way for a long time, and he's been taking a lot of shots too. His knockout against Josh Emmett was super impressive back in February of 18. But then he loses to Aldo via TKO. And then he loses to Zabit in a very one-sided unanimous decision. And, you know, a lot of people compare the striking, the flashiness of Zabit and Yair Rodriguez. And based on, you know, Jeremy Stevens' cardio also, we haven't really seen that test and test the third round in, I don't know, a very long time. But there are times where you've seen him in that third round. If he doesn't land a crazy shot, he's usually not winning that third round. You know, in the, uh, but, you know, Yair is not really going to provide a threat with the takedowns. Um, I just don't know if Jeremy Stevens is going to be able to really handle the speed, uh, the distance, you know, the reach that Yair Rodriguez is going to have in this fight. I think it's going to be a, a good amount. You know, he's a tall, lean fighter. He throws a lot of things. I'm glad you didn't pick decision. At least that's good. Um, <laughs> that would have been wild. Because if you would have won that one by decision, I would have been, uh, I would have been floored by that. <laughs> I was going to go opposite of whatever you picked anyway, just to try to get back and since we both picked the same. But I really thought you were going to go Yair Rodriguez. I'm going to go home field advantage. Um, I know Stevens has the experience. He's fought in very high level of competition. I just think the speed factor, I think training in you know, New Mexico City with that, you know, with that elevation is going to be really challenging for Stevens. I know he's been there for a little bit, but that doesn't really – that doesn't compare to being there full time. And I think Rodriguez, you know, in this location has to shine. This is his moment. This is his breakout moment. And I'm going to say that he finishes Jeremy Stevens in round two. Round wow. two, are you going TKO or sub? TKO. There will be no submissions from Yair Rodriguez in this fight. All right, Yair Rodriguez, round two, TKO. Sounds to me, Ian, though, like a fight you won't necessarily be betting. Is that fair? I mean, I know you're going to bet it to have some action, but it doesn't sound like you have this huge appetite to go bet Yair Rodriguez. It's really hard right now. It's not that I wouldn't lean that way. I got to, you know, for this type of fight, I got to see how Jeremy did with the weight cut. I got to see what these guys look like on the right. scales. You right. know, it really does matter because this is, you know, Kenny really said this. And again, I'm not just blowing smoke because it's Ken Flo and everyone loves Kenny. And I get it. It's the eyebrows and the hair. It's beautiful. <laughs> but, you know, it's the fact that, you know, it's the fact that Jeremy Steven just brings a certain level of power in this division. And I think maybe outside of like him and Josh Emmett, it doesn't really exist consistently. You know, you don't hear too many yeah. one-hitter quitters in the lower weight classes. And Stevens really brings that. And he doesn't just throw it haphazard. He's calculated with it. He's been around long enough. And that's really his method, you know, his path to victory. Unless he surprises everyone, he puts the on his back for a couple of rounds to try and steal some rounds. That could happen too. Um, but that's just not the way Stevens rolls. So, 
you know, to your point, I can't bet that fight confidently one way or the other yet. Um, you'll have to get back to me later in the week for that one. All right. And you can catch Ian Parker live at Anik Florian Pod on Instagram doing those live hits with Ken Flo and with me every now and again. So maybe we'll get to you on yeah. Saturday in, uh, in Mexico City. Yeah, let's do one this week. Look at Kenny being proactive with it. I wow. Like it. All right. Uh, all right, Ian. Good stuff, buddy. Uh, anything else before we let you fly, kid? Yeah, I actually was going to want to get from you and Kenny your guys' thoughts on the whole Justin Gaethje situation. I, you know, I don't know if you guys covered that. If you did, I don't want anything to be redundant. And I apologize. Oh, yeah, we talked about it. I mean, were you? Uh, did you have something that you wanted to add or piggyback on? I really hope that if the UFC wants to build this guy into the megastar he really can be, that they do actually give him Conor McGregor because I, I think the Tony fight really has to happen. I think if Tony Ferguson somehow does not get a title fight, that's just criminal at this point. I've been very heavy on that situation. And I think that Gaethje versus Conor, listen, we're at a point right now that who are you going to fight? Who's going to fight Conor that there's any value in bumping Conor up into a title spot? You know? If, like, for example, if Conor beats Gaethje, then the story could be told whoever Conor could fight the winner of Habib and Tony. Then it matters. Yeah. The lack, yeah. Of, activity, I agree. The lack of activity is just is poison. Uh, Ian, I said the exact same thing. We're on the same frequency today, I think, and uh, besides the main event in Mexico. But, uh, no, I agree. Listen, when you're trying to sell a fight, you want to make sure that the fans are going to get their money's worth. I mean, what's better than Gaethje and Conor McGregor? Oh. No, and you know what? And I don't think that – I think if Conor loses, what does that really change for his legacy at this point? He's coming off a loss anyway. I think Conor – has done everything he possibly could do for the sport. And if he gets knocked out by Gaethje, so is almost everyone else, right? Yep. If you handle it with class and respect like Cowboy, you could still fight big money fights because of who you are. And what you did was, this is like a WWE uh, move, you're putting a guy over. You're, you're kind of throwing Gaethje into stardom now, uh, into mainstream. You know, a lot yeah. of uh, casual MMA fans may not know who he is, <laughs> which is a crime. You know, this is a guy that goes in there to, in a division – probably the hardest division in the history of the sport, and he's knocking guys out like it's no problem. And this yeah, fight, even, and Kenny, I, I want to hear your opinion on this, but Kenny, was this not his most impressive win just based on how patient he was, how technical his striking was? I mean, he didn't do his usual brawl. He looked really solid in there. Yes. First of all, he didn't take a lot of damage, which is unusual for a Gaethje fight, right? This has been a trend now where he's winning these fights by brutal knockouts and not taking a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. And number two... Um, either way, you set up a, a, an amazing fight against Habib Nurmagomedov should he win the belt or with Tony Ferguson, right, uh, f for the championship at 155 pounds between the winner of Gaethje and Connor. So, I mean, I, I think it's a win-win. I think that's the direction the UFC should go to. Uh, and uh, I don't know. We'll see what happens, man. The question is, will Connor take that fight? Will Connor make well, exactly. it? Exactly. Therein I, lies the rub. You know. That's it. It's all right there. It's you know, promotionally, uh, you you can be sure they will try to make that fight. I mean, how could it just it aligns perfectly, you know? Yeah. Well, sometimes it just feels like, and coming from a managing Brock background, sometimes they try to protect certain guys with certain things. If you look at career paths, I mean, you go back and look at Connor's career path. I don't think until he fought Chad Mendes, he fought a really strong wrestler, and Chad Mendes took that fight on short notice. If you go back and watch that fight, Mendes was dominating him until he gassed out. You know, this is a guy in Gaethje who we haven't even seen wrestle, and he can absolutely wrestle. It's just we know that he's going to go in there. He's going to try and take Connor's head off. I, man, I get I get chills even thinking about it. I really hope they do it. Oh, I hope it's the co-main event to Habib versus Tony and blow the roof oh. off the place. Oh, I mean, we can only pray. All right, buddy, uh, that'll be it from you for today. Just kidding, buddy. Great stuff, yes, as sir. always. No, do you have a good. kid in the car? Do you have a kid in the car doing those picks today? <laughs> I do. Uh, my son handed me notes because cool. he uh, was very upset that uh, Todd Duffy quit when he was getting tired of <laughs> <and> <laughs> yeah. getting back in the wind column. That's good. <laughs> oh, way to punch it on the way out, buddy. We'll talk to you next week. Have a good one, guys. All right, we got to get on out of here. May Rocky BJJ must be beckoning at some point today. I mean, how do you not hit those gray mats like six out of seven days a week? I'm on my way there right now. I left there about midnight with Ryan Hall. Been training like an animal. I, I can tell, dude. Lean and mean. All right, we will talk to you all in a week's time. We'll see who emerges in that killer main event. 
Yaya Rodriguez, Jeremy Stevens. Also get you some picks for the Copenhagen show. Or is it Copenhagen? I don't know. We'll have to get that for you by next week. Jack Hermanson, Jared Cannonier. The main event there. Thank you to our guests today, Ray Longo, Joe Osborne, and Parker, our producers, TJ DeSantis. Thanks to every last one of you for listening, for subscribing, maybe now watching, uh, and also for getting the message out there about the show. This thing would have been dead a long time ago without you all, so thank you for that. Have a great week and weekend. For Ken Flo, I'm John Anik. We'll talk to you next Monday. Until then, yo fucking later. The John Anik and Kenny Florian Podcast is a TJ DeSantis production. Its content is intended for private use only.